Okay. Good evening, everybody. Warm welcome. Um, I, I think it sort of felt just about spring like today, so I'm absolutely delighted to see everybody this evening um, at this uh, most recent uh, Cold Spring Harbor public lecture Energy from Thin Air Basic Research to Biofuels. So, this is a little bit of an unusual topic. Um, we quite often have um, very um, serious medical issues. Today, we'll have a little bit more fun, and I'm uh, delighted to introduce our two speakers today, Professor Rob Martinson and finance and entrepreneur, finance expert and entrepreneur Frank O'Keefe. So just to introduce myself, I'm Andrew Whiteley. I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Technology Transfer here at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. My job is to work with the academic staff to find ways of exploiting their ideas and inventions um, and, and put them into public practice. And uh, I can't think of two um, more um, august members of our team who um, you know, really fill the bill on that way. So as many of you probably know, plant science and research into genetics of plants has been a major focus of work here at Cold Spring Harbor Labs for over 125 years. In 1908, Professor Schull revolutionized modern agriculture through his work on hybrid vigor. And later in her work in the 40s, all the way through to the 90s, Nobel laureate Barbara McClintock discovered transposons or jumping genes in corn, crops that were initially grown outside of our library building just down here on the hill. So Rob, Rob Martinson, worked with Barbara at the end of her career, and his early work continued to define the role of those jumping genes that later led to his discovery of a link between heterochromatin and RNA interference, which he received the AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Award in 2003. Rob is a fellow of the Royal Society in Britain and an investigator of the, of the prestigious Howard Hughes Medical Institute and fellow in residence at Inst Institut uh, Pasteur in Paris. This year, Rob is only the fourth scientist who have been granted the Barbara McClintock Prize for Plant Genetics and Genome Studies by the Maze Guys. So Rob is also an entrepreneur. He's the scientific co-founder of a St. Louis company called Orion Genomics. Um, Rob will share a, a quick story from Orion and also how his introduction to Frank has led to an interest in the humble plant, duckweed or lemna, in creating a green source of energy. Our first speaker today though is Frank O'Keefe. Uh, Frank is an expert in finance, economics and financial risk management. So Frank earned his MSc from Yale School of Management, and after working at Lehman Brothers, Bankers Trust, and JP Morgan, established his own risk management company in 99 that grew to over seven billion in fixed income, as well as um, a large amount of floating rate uh, debt and nearly two billion in swap contracts. So Frank has had a long time interest in the CO2 capture area and the science behind it and founded a company called Infinitry to exploit IP in this area. Frank has had a long time association with Cold Spring Harbor Labs, serving on our board, including the term as president of the Laboratories Association Board. Through discussion with Bruce Stillman, who wasn't able to make it this evening, Frank was introduced to Rob, and that led to a unique collaboration looking to combine plant genomics and biochemistry with CO2 capture engineering which leads on to this idea of forming um, a unique green source of, of energy. Anyway, these guys are experts in this field and will tell you a lot more about that. So it's my pleasure to introduce Frank to, to the stand. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Good evening and thank you so much for coming out to hear about uh, the potential to make energy out of thin air. Uh, I, uh, I hope you permit me to frame the discussion a bit uh, because I'd like to talk to you about how important it is that we do, in fact, uh, create energy from the air. Uh, we certainly have put the detritus of uh, creating energy into the air, and therefore we now have to find a way to take it out and recycle it. Uh, In Jefferson's original effort uh, to write the Declaration of Independence, uh, 
he does in fact speak of life, liberty, and happiness, but he also wants a commitment in the declaration that, uh, that assures that one generation will hand to the next generation in use of fruct, the land as they found it. That means, that means that you hand the land over, not despoiled by your activities, but exactly as you found it, so that the next generation, the generations thereafter, can enjoy it as you have. Uh, I guess the hard question we have today, uh, given the news about climate and our growth, uh, is, is how, in fact, can we hand over the land to the next generation and those that will follow in usufruct? And clearly the news is very tough. Uh, just looking at yesterday's Week in Review, um, on page nine, below the fold, we have uh, Massachusetts, 36% uh, uh, below the Atlantic Ocean, uh, well distant into the future, admittedly, but nonetheless, it's a scary prospect, and that's what you were greeted with yesterday morning. And above the fold, uh, the story was, uh, was even more grim uh, about a gentleman who took his life to protest the lack of action uh, to address environmental risks that we face today. But within that article was a remarkable uh, quote, and it was uh, uttered by Winston Churchill. And uh, excuse me for reading it, you can read it yourselves, but I'll, in casting up this dread balance sheet and contemplating our dangers with a disillusioned eye, I see great reason for intense vigilance and exertion, but none whatever for panic and despair. And Churchill uttered that line at the, at the moment when France was about to fall. What the article doesn't address is the fall of Holland uh, not long before, days before, and the occupation of Southeast Asia, the growing occupation of Southeast Asia uh, by the Japanese. Why is that important? It's important because the United States got 90% of its rubber from Southeast Asia. And all of that Southeast Asian rubber production were from Dutch colonies. So suddenly, that rubber production dried up. What did we do? We created out of whole cloth 38 synthetic rubber plants. 38 synthetic rubber plants. In 1941, we created 8,000 tons of rubber in this country. By 1945, we were, we were manufacturing 830,000 tons of synthetic rubber in, in this country. And that enabled us to stop the Nazis. I worked at one of those plants in 1984 and 85. We made tires. We also did something else. We made additives for oils. The additive was a polymer, and the additive enabled the oil to maintain a consistent viscosity in high heat and very low temperatures. And that process was a catalyst process. And off the catalyst came an effluent, because the catalyst process, like all processes, was inefficient. The effluent had within it some vestige of the raw material, which was very valuable to us. What did we do? We froze it into a liquid, separated that effluent, purified the, the propylene that we wanted to reuse, and were able to be profitable because of that recovery and recapture process. In 2001, I met Dr. Klaus Lackner. He had been interviewed, and I heard the interview. In the interview, he said that we need to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. It is the detritus of the energy that we have burnt since we began burning energy. We need to recapture that and reuse it to create useful products, including energy. I called him up. He was a professor at Columbia. And I went to meet him. And I said, how are you going to do that? 
And he said, well, we've got this chemical sorbent, and we only have to heat it up to a couple of hundred degrees, which was an improvement off of 1,652 degrees, which was previously what you had to heat a sorbent to get CO2 off of it. And uh, he said, but we can improve on that. And that was important. Improving on that was crucial, because if you didn't, you spent as much carbon to get the carbon out of the atmosphere, uh, and therefore you'd made no gain. Uh, so I signed up. I said, Klaus, this is fascinating, and we need to pursue it. And from that came my company, Infinitry. Uh, and, and now I'd like to tell you about uh, what that dread balance sheet looks like. So there it is. Uh, a, a gentleman named Keeling uh, began to take measurements of, of carbon, uh, of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere in Hawaii in the late 50s. And, uh, and this is what the progression shows. If you've seen Al Gore's first movie, uh, you, you saw him describe this and explain what's ahead. Uh, so it is, in fact, a dread balance sheet, but, but is it completely? Is it completely? That line uh, goes up, but then it comes down, that red line. And then it comes down again the next year. It comes down in each year, as a matter of fact. What's happening there? What's happening when that line comes down? What's happening is summer. What's happening is summertime. And plants, plants are eating CO2 and releasing oxygen. Plants by themselves, while we fly to California, while we drive to work, while we make steel, plants themselves are, in fact, reducing atmospheric concentration. There's our hope. There's our hope. We have the opportunity to harness that potential, to take plants, feed them concentrated uh, uh, CO2, and, and they'll do the work for us. So that's what this talk's really about, and uh, thank you for permitting me to frame it. Uh, can we, in fact, harness plants to change climate? Uh, can we, in fact, harness plants to create energy? Uh, well, there is historical precedent for this, and, uh, and this is, in fact, Earth. It's Earth 49 million years ago during the Eocene. And as you can see, uh, the continents are largely arrayed around the roof of the planet, uh, enclosing what is today where the Arctic Sea sits. And that uh, phenomenon uh, created an opportunity for plants to grow in that enclosed sea. Uh, how, how was it that they were able to grow on the Arctic Sea? Well, it was a vastly different planet. CO2 concentrations were probably 3,000 parts per million or higher. Uh, temperatures, 72 degrees in the water up there. Crocodiles lived in it, in the Arctic. So it was a vastly different place. And in fact, because of that, and there's so much moisture in the air, it rained a lot. And it was, in fact, a, a receptacle for river water. And, and what happened was aquatic plants flourished. They flourished because they evolved in that high, high CO2 environment and, and consumed uh, CO2 uh, to their heart's content. And what happened over the course of 800,000 years uh, was that those plants changed climate. These aquatic plants changed climate. And that event is called the Azola event. Uh, it is... Uh, an event that we will return to, that Rob will return to in his talk. Uh, but it gives us considerable hope because what did happen is that uh, CO2 concentrations uh, likely came down to as low as 800 parts per million, so just a little less than twice what they are today. And it began the possibility of an ice house uh, planet, uh, a, a, a planet where we can, in fact, have glaciers, uh, which, which uh, was not the case uh, 49 million years ago. Uh, so it changed the climate. Uh, so how does that help us given what our needs are going to be energy-wise 
uh, for the foreseeable future. Well, let's not focus on the foreseeable future. Let's focus on the next 25 years or so. Uh, it's pretty scary. Uh, what's being projected by people who would know is a requirement, a requirement for energy security given uh, populations that are becoming wealthy, giving our own voracious need for energy. We're predicting that in the next 25 years or so, we're going to require 80% of everything we've burned to date on the planet. 80% of everything we've burned to date. Well, that's a lot of oil. That's a lot of gas. That's a lot of coal. And if that were to all come from uh, fossil fuels, well, atmospheric concentrations would rise in lockstep. And I think it's safe to say that we would have a climate catastrophe. Uh, so our business is to consider an alternative means of achieving energy security. So I ask you to engage with me in a, uh, a thought exercise. Uh, so we have a cubic meter of air. And uh, let's just say we, we're going to capture that cubic meter of air in a windmill. And let's just say for uh, purposes of today that that cubic meter of air is moving at a rapid clip of about 22 and a half miles an hour. So it's, it's fairly windy. Uh, so we capture that cubic meter of air in a windmill. And we create 58 joules of energy. Pretty good. Pretty good. 58 joules of energy. So we've done something. Uh, now let's take a look at that cubic meter of air from a different perspective. Let's just say that that cubic meter of air uh, it has CO2 in it that was in fact created by the burning of gasoline. And let's just say it was created by the burning of SO gasoline in 1964. You remember SO. So, so that, that was uh, burned by my parents as they drove me off to get a pizza in 1964. And, uh, and the energy created by that burning uh, by, by, the, by, the, by the CO2 in that cubic meter of air uh, amounts to 10 kilojoules. So 170 times the amount of energy that we could grab from that cubic meter if we caught it with a windmill. So think about that. We have the possibility of creating legacy CO2 and utilizing it to create new energy for the future by feeding it to plants. Now, given what we just saw in terms of our energetic needs for the next 25 years or so, I think we have to capture that CO2 from that cubic meter of air and do it over and over and over again and try to create energy from plants in a carbon neutral manner. Our technology has been long in development. Uh, I've started work, I started working on my company in 2011. And, uh, and what we've tried to do was to create an efficient, low energy means of capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. Now that's hard to do. Uh, when you capture anything on a sorbent, it takes energy to break the bonds. You all remember 10th grade chemistry, and you remember that breaking a covalent bond requires a lot of energy, whether it's high heat, whether it's pulling a, pulling a vacuum, it's not easy to do. So what we discovered uh, was remarkable and gave us hope that we could feed uh, greenhouses, vertical farms with cheap, low energy CO2 with a, an enviable carbon footprint. So what we use is moisture, which is available in abundance inside of a greenhouse. We use moisture. The moisture alone is sufficient to release the CO2 from our sorbents. Uh, and what we've done is, in fact, pursue a path since that discovery of the moisture swing, the humidity swing, of, of attempt, attempting to explore other materials, other sorbents, that capture CO2 very efficiently and can do so over and over and over again so this process is, is 
of, of low cost. We also need to do it quickly because the more cycles that we can do in a day, the less sorbent we need, the smaller the system has to be, and the cheaper it can be for the cultivator. So that has been our lengthy process, is to spend time to optimize the sorbents that we're using and to optimize the contact with the air, to change the geometry of the sorbent, and to make sure that we're getting the most CO2 for the energy we're spending. Uh, so this discovery is something that gives us great hope, and, uh, and it's something that's gotten us some attention. We are, in fact, finalists in the Virgin Earth Challenge. 10,000 applications, 11 finalists. It's an important challenge. Richard Branson made it, and he made it some time ago, and he made it to inspire entrepreneurs to go out and try and find ways to capture a lot of carbon. In fact, he, he put a number on it, put a gigaton a year away, and I think they've softened that a bit because a gigaton is a lot of CO2. It's a lot of carbon. Uh, but that was the ambition, and, and, and he did, in fact, inspire a lot of investment, a lot of, of work to try and create that, uh, that outcome. We've been hard at it uh, for some time, and, uh, and, and I think that it's been a very fruitful process for us. And uh, we've, we've recently, we, we've, with some frequency, have to update what our thinking is about, about how we will, in fact, put away a lot of CO2. Uh, so our eventual submission will, will represent not just applications like creation of fuel or plastics or uh, aiding in the cultivation of tomatoes or lettuce, uh, but it will also have and has a sequestration strategy. And what you see here is just that. Uh, so that is a, uh, a farm that's not ours, but it is one that we would utilize as a model for a farm for the plant that Rob will now talk about. The reason we would use that plant is because it so voraciously consumes CO2 that for us to grow it in layers, 25 layers per our design, so you've got a vertical farm of 25 growth layers, would enable us to put away a lot of CO2. And you may have read, to go back to the New York Times, you may have read over the weekend about the potential of soil sequestration. That's our solution. So our solution has a number of steps, and I won't go into it in depth because we want to get to Rob's discussion, but the key point is that of all of the carbon sinks on the planet, soil is the one that is the most vast, unlike the ocean, it hasn't acidified, and in fact wants the CO2. We have used CO2 to make the corn in the American Midwest, and that soil wants CO2 back. So that's our strategy, and I would urge you actually to go and look up the article in the, the Weekend Times Magazine because it really states what the objective is very clearly, and that's part of our strategy. So we hope to put away gigatons of CO2 in soil, and that picture uh, is in fact uh, part of our system. Uh, we are, all of us, changing the earth. Uh, we do so in an in infinitesimal way, independently, uh, but together uh, we make quite a big difference. And, uh, and that's something that should cause us to uh, step back and take note. Uh, the fact is that the gentleman you remember years ago, we had a, a challenge on the planet about what to do uh, with, with ozone depletion. It looked like an earth ending or a human ending problem, and it, it is if it's not addressed. Uh, the noblest who, who discovered, did the work on no ozone depleting uh, chemicals in the atmosphere, uh, Crutzen, uh, has since suggested that the, the time that we're living in, the epoch, should be named after us, should be named after us because what will come from here, how the earth will evolve from here, is dependent on our activities. Now that's something to consider. Uh, so what, what we're hoping to do is to turn back the clock a bit uh, 
and to create at massive scale an ability to draw down CO2, put it in plants which wants it anyway, and put it in soil which also wants it. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Rob Martinson. Uh, Rob is about to speak to you. And, uh, and it's been a, a tremendous experience for me. He's informed our work. He's informed our understanding of plants and what they do. And uh, he's made us better. And he's got a lot to say tonight. Uh, but before I turn it over to him, I also want to thank Dr. Raffaella Sordella for her work in, in creating our, 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 our responses to, ver to the Virgin people. And I also want to thank uh, President Bruce Stillman for his unending support of our activities uh, at Infinitry. Uh, so again, my thanks to you for listening this evening. I'll return in, in probably about 30 minutes. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Frank, for that wonderful uh, introduction for that inspiring, I think, uh, uh, how did you put it, framing of the problem. Um, I'm going to tell you today about uh, a possible solution, maybe. <laughs> we have a long way to go yet. Uh, but at least about our excitement um, about uh, use of, of, of plants uh, in producing green energy, uh, literally from thin air. Uh, the work I'm going to tell you about is the result of a, a long-standing collaboration between Frank and Infinitry, but also this group, uh, which is the Long Island uh, Biofuels Alliance, which sort of started with Brookhaven and Cold Spring Harbor Lab, my good buddy, uh, John Shanklin, uh, but we've been joined since by friends at, at Rutgers and the University of Missouri. Uh, just to uh, put into context again what Frank was, uh, was saying, when we think about fossil fuels, uh, what we're really doing is taking uh, carbon that was laid down by ancient plants and the animals that ate them uh, and consuming it in such a way as to produce energy and to release that carbon into the atmosphere. Now, the idea of biofuels is to be able to take the carbon from the atmosphere and fix it again into plants. Uh, if we uh, engineer those plants in the appropriate way, harvest them in the appropriate way, uh, we can use them to make biofuels, which then give us energy, which then uh, is released to some extent as atmospheric carbon, and so on. And so, in a sense, we short-circuit the otherwise uh, one-way street uh, that fossil fuels represent. But in order to put this into, in, into some sort of uh, context, and this is perhaps the dread balance sheet that uh, Frank was talking about, uh, most estimates would say that it took about 200 million years to build up uh, the carbon uh, that is now in the accessible uh, fossil reserves that we have, the coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, most estimates agree, as Frank was saying, that it would take about another 200 years uh, to burn that off, uh, which is a million to one ratio. So that's the challenge. We have to be able to fix carbon a million times faster uh, than it was uh, fixed <laughs> by natural circumstances. And that is a tall order, I want to tell you. We're not there yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, biofuels uh, have been the subject of uh, a great deal of uh, research for, for many, many years. And I often like to put up this balance sheet that was actually developed by the World Watch Institute uh, about 20 years ago now, so it's a little out of date. Uh, to look at the fossil energy balance of biofuels in use today. So what that means is how many units of fossil energy are required to put in, like fuel for the tractors and so on, uh, in order to get a certain amount of energy out. Uh, and for example, a very popular form of biofuels in, in the United States, corn ethanol, has a very miserable uh, energy balance. While it might have a lot of benefit for uh, you know, presidential candidates in Iowa primaries, uh, it really doesn't do much uh, for the atmosphere. Uh, whereas some of these other plants actually are uh, quite good biofuels, uh, there's a lot of excitement about uh, prairie grass and other sorts of grasses that can be converted into ethanol through a process known as cellulosic conversion. Uh, this really hasn't been done yet, but theoretically it has, it has a tremendous potential. But in terms of existing uh, uh, fossil, uh, existing uh, bioenergy uh, plants, oil palm uh, and, and sugarcane actually are tremendous uh, uh, sources of, of biofuels. Uh, and interestingly, along with some of the other uh, plants I'll be telling you about, and, uh, and of course various sorts of algae, uh, these energy crops are all clones. And I don't have time to tell you uh, 
perhaps the genetic reason why that's the case, but it's interesting to think uh, that that's true of all of these plants. As Andrew uh, told you, I'm just going to give you a quick example of uh, the sort of research uh, that we've been able to do over the years um, to help uh, the production of, of oil from oil palm. Oil palm is actually cloned. It's micropropagated, a bit like orchids. Uh, so, for example, you can take a mature tree uh, or a mature palm uh, whose yield is well known uh, and uh, take a tiny piece of the heart of that palm, uh, put it into cell culture and generate literally tens of thousands of genetically identical clones from that oil palm. In principle, this gives you a wonderful increase in yield. But unfortunately, the cloning process uh, introduces all sorts of interesting abnormalities uh, which means that some of these, many of these clones are not as they appear. And uh, a, 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 a Cold Spring Harbor spin-off company known as Orion Genomics, which I was uh, a, a privileged to be a co-founder of many years ago, has collaborated with the Malaysian government, the Malaysian Palm Oil Board, uh, to develop, uh, first of all to discover, uh, and then to develop simple DNA tests that allow us to distinguish one uh, bad uh, oil palm tree uh, from a good one uh, after the cloning process. This led to one of my favorite um, uh, uh, titles uh, of a Nature article, Weed Out Bad Karma. Uh, the reason uh, this, this isn't just a, a play on, uh, on words, the reason this was a, it was, it was a reasonable title is because the, uh, the actual underlying abnormality is, is a transposon or a jumping gene, the same class of genes discovered by Barbara all those years ago, and, and, the, and, and the transposon had already been called karma by another group, so we had this wonderful, uh, wonderful headline. Uh, but of course, oil palm, uh, although it's a, a very efficient energy crop, has all sorts of other issues if you want to scale it up uh, to, uh, to solve uh, the biofuel uh, equation. Uh, first of all, uh, oil palm is actually the source of half of all the edible uh, vegetable oil on the planet. So uh, any sort of uh, fuel production will compete with food production. And secondly, perhaps most importantly, oil palm only grows in a very narrow latitude in the tropics and uh, has a really devastating impact on rainforests. This is a picture taken over Borneo by one of my uh, colleagues at the uh, Malaysian Oil Palm Board, uh, showing on the left some of the oldest rainforest on Earth and on the right an oil palm plantation. And you can see, you can see the impact on the environment. So we're very much hoping that these tests will allow farmers to grow the same amount of oil from a much smaller amount of land. But clearly oil palm is not the solution to the, to the problem that Frank uh, laid out. Instead, we've started working with aquatic plants. Aquatic plants, I'm going to tell you a lot more about the physiological uh, functions that give them a really uh, hopeful uh, sort of uh, uh, spectrum of qualities uh, that will make them the ideal uh, source of biofuels and the ideal uh, plant to capture carbon. We're actually uh, working with Lemnaceae. Uh, these are common duckweeds. I'm sure you have them growing on your pond at home. Any of the ponds around here will have them uh, covered in duckweed. It is in fact a flowering plant, uh, but uh, it's one of the most uh, rapidly growing plant, perhaps the most uh, rapidly growing flowering plant on earth, as any, as any gardener can tell you who's been trying to get rid of it from their, from their pond. Uh, it's actually a very simple plant. It has uh, a very reduced morphology. It buds clonally, so it's a clone, just like those other clones, uh, and can do that without uh, having to go through any sort of sexual reproduction at all, although they are capable of flowering. Many species are capable of flowering. Uh, but generally speaking, they duplicate by budding, and they double in, in, in mass under normal, everyday conditions every 48 hours, which makes them the fastest growing uh, plant on Earth. And if you do the, the numbers, this means that a 10 centimeter squared patch of duckweed uh, floating on water will grow to one hectare in only a couple of months. And that sort of gives you an idea of the scale of these remarkable plants. Uh, they can flower, though. This is a, 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 a quite high magnification <laughs> a micrograph uh, showing uh, the, the flowers of duckweed. They're extremely simple. There's a, a simple style and two anthers, and you can even see some pollen some pollen here. So you can persuade them to flower, which helps with uh, doing genetics. Uh, probably the most important characteristic of aquatic plants uh, that makes them highly relevant to carbon capture and also to the Azolar event, which I'll be coming back to later on, is that, of course, uh, aquatic plants live on water. Uh, most plants uh, have to conserve their water. 
And as a result, the stomata, which allow uh, exchange of gases between the atmosphere and the plant, are very important gatekeepers of water loss. They're also the gatekeeper of CO2 uptake. So if CO2 levels get very high, and this has actually been monitored in, 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 real, in real terms with the raising uh, of CO2 levels that's happening now, uh, the stomata will actually close because they have enough CO2 already uh, from their photosynthesis and they're trying to protect themselves from losing water. So especially in, in, in hot and arid conditions, uh, terrestrial plants will close their stomata. Duckweed, however, along with other aquatic plants, doesn't have to close its stomata because it doesn't have a water loss problem. It's already sitting on the water. And in fact, some species of duckweeds, the ones, we, the ones that we're using, like Lemna minor, uh, can't close its stomata at all. So it's permanently uh, available to take up CO2. And in fact, some very old uh, physiological data uh, uh, taken, I think, in Brookhaven, actually, years, probably 20, 30 years ago, uh, demonstrates this very nicely. So if in those days, uh, if you grew uh, duckweed at, uh, at ambient CO2, uh, 350 ppm, I can tell you it's a lot higher now, but back in 1985, that's what it was, uh, uh, you get this uh, photosynthetic efficiency at these different light intensities. So it saturates out at, at this light intensity. But if you increase the CO2 to 5,000 ppm, you get even more CO2 fixation. And this is not true of most plants. You wouldn't see that a dramatic gain. So it, uh, duckweed is able to grow to respond to very high levels of CO2. And this is an experiment we did uh, with Frank and also with John Shanklin at Brookhaven, very simple experiment. Uh, this, this flask a week ago had a single uh, duckweed frond uh, inoculated into the medium, so did this one. Uh, but this one was grown in an incubator uh, which had 400 ppm CO2, and this one was grown in one at 1500 ppm. And you can see that we had a massive increase in doubling rate, up to four times the normal doubling rate, which means now it's doubling every 12 hours. That is remarkable, and it means that we can feed, or we like to say irrigate, uh, our, uh, our duckweed with CO2 and have it absorb that CO2 into biomass. Uh, so Lemnaceae, uh, that's the Latin word for duckweeds, uh, are an excellent source of biomass. Uh, they're already used uh, uh, around the world, especially in Southeast Asia, for various uh, applications. Uh, they can be grown readily uh, on wastewater. In fact, they're very good at remediating nitrogen and phosphorus, as, as a, again, anyone who's fertilized their lawn next to a pond will quickly realize. Uh, they are the fastest growing plants. They have very low lignin content because they don't have branches or trunks or anything like that. They're none of the structures that hold most plants terrestrial plants up, and that's really good news because lignin is a toxin that's quite difficult to get rid of in many biofuel applications. Uh, they have, uh, if, if you grow them under control conditions, they essentially have continuous production. So you never, you don't have seasons if you grow them in, in vertical farms, for example. And they're very cheap and easy to grow. Uh, uh, in terms of their metabolic profile, uh, they, 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 they are very simple, but very, uh, very good for biofuels. They actually have quite a high protein uh, content. They have some lipids. They have a very high starch content when they're grown in certain conditions. So uh, when duckweed overwinters, it actually forms these starch granules. You can even see them here, uh, stained, uh, stained here in, in, in Spiridella, uh, that enable them to sink to the bottom of the pond and avoid surface ice. Uh, starch is heavier than water. And for that's why they have it, but this is very convenient if you want to make ethanol, for example. Uh, but ethanol is not the best uh, uh, biofuel for a lot of, uh, of, of fairly obvious reasons. Uh, and so uh, our goal is to make oil from duckweed. Uh, this is absolutely possible. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the physiology and biochemistry behind oil production is very well understood. Uh, and, uh, and, and we think we can do it from duckweed. We need uh, first to develop uh, molecular biology, so DNA tools that allow us uh, to, uh, to modify duckweed. Uh, we also need to understand a lot more about duckweed development and metabolism. Uh, and then uh, we can generate these lines uh, that silence some of the genes uh, that we, that, for example, make starch, uh, that channels uh, carbon into starch, and overexpress the genes uh, that channel carbon into oil. That's a very simplified version of, of what's going on, but, but that's, that's essentially what our goals are. Uh, to start that uh, process, we've uh, sequenced the genome of duckweed, the Duckweed Genome Project. You've all heard of the Human Genome Project. Well, this was the Duckweed Genome Project. The Human Genome Pro Project cost 
something, uh, something in the order of a billion dollars and took about 25 years and the efforts of, of literally hundreds of people, many of whom will be here next week for the Colspring Harbor Genome and Biology meeting. The Duckweed Genome Project was performed by Evan Ernst in my lab, <laughs> uh, costing an awful lot less than that, uh, taking advantage of the latest technology in sequencing, which is truly amazing. This is a little, a little device you can hook up to your laptop, you can take home to your apartment in Brooklyn, and, uh, and pipette on DNA from the lemma, and you get these wonderful, huge, uh, huge contigs for the uh, for the cognoscenti. So Lemni, uh, Lemnesi have uh, 21 chromosomes. We have, we have 23 in the human genome uh, and about 19,000 genes. That may seem like a lot. It's actually very few for a plant. And so it has a pretty stripped down uh, uh, genome. This allows us, of course, to identify the genes required to make starch or to make oil. This is a very complicated slide and I'm not gonna go through it, but I wanted to show you a little bit of the science uh, that's, that, that we're doing. This is actually from our collaborators at Brookhaven. And they've uh, put together a pathway taking advantage of the genomic sequence, but also a lot of experimental data, uh, telling us which genes in blue and in red here uh, are required uh, to either make oil or starch. And so by uh, overexpressing these genes and reducing the expression of these, uh, we hope to be able to shift the balance from starch to oil. And we've already started this process. In order to make this uh, work, of course, the first thing we had to do uh, was to uh, introduce DNA in a permanent way into duckweed. Uh, this is called DNA or genetic transformation. Uh, this uh, had been done before, but was extremely inefficient and actually it had only been done by one group and no one had been able to repeat it. Uh, so uh, a number of people in the lab, uh, notably Alex Canto Pastor and Almedina, Almedina uh, Mola Morales, uh, uh, teamed up uh, to figure out the best way to do this and they were successful after a couple of years. This is just an example. They put the, uh, the, the green fluorescent protein from jellyfish uh, into duckweed, uh, starting out in tissue culture here, but ending up with these, these fronds, and I'll show you more examples, uh, that are now completely transformed with this, this gene for, for jellyfish. And I just hot off the press, uh, our patent describing this process was actually granted last week, so we're all very excited about that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, the next step is to either silence genes or to express them. Again, this is a bit complicated, but we know how to silence genes very well. Uh, we use short hairpin RNAs to do this. Again, a technology that was developed here, uh, mostly for use in, in mammalian cells. Uh, but we've been able to apply it to duckweed very successfully. This just shows you how to do it. Uh, we use a microRNA back backbone. We picked some uh, target genes uh, just for fun. These are involved in chlorophyll production and actually by knocking them down, you, in you enhance photosynthetic efficiency uh, and that worked very well. Here again, this is uh, a control uh, uh, duckweed that does not have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the transgenic uh, DNA in it and this is one that does. We've labeled it again with GFP and we can silence genes very efficiently and actually very, very specifically. So these were two copies of the gene and we targeted only one and that was the only one we silenced. So it's very good for off-target effects. Uh, so what about oil? Uh, well, uh, we've started the process of getting duckweed to make oil. Uh, the first gene we picked is sometimes regarded as the master regulator of oil. It's called wrinkled. Uh, it comes from maize. And the reason it's called wrinkled is because if you make a wrinkled mutation in corn, you get a wrinkled or shriveled seed. That's because it's not making oil anymore. Uh, and so we took that gene, put it into duckweed, again, uh, successfully using our GFP uh, marker. Uh, and we, when we examined oil levels using a very simple, you can think of this almost as an oil smudge uh, on, a, on a plate, uh, we could tell that we had a very substantial increase in oil right away with just one gene, not taking the whole pathway or anything like that, uh, but, but just taking that one gene. And that was very, uh, very exciting. It means we're on the right track. It means the pathway is intact in, in duckweed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the wrinkled one overexpressing uh, duckweeds don't enjoy making oil. <laughs> they, uh, they'd rather not be making oil. They'd rather be making starch. Uh, and uh, as a result, they look a bit, they look a bit funky compared to the, their normal uh, uh, friends. Uh, and they have a decreased growth rate, which is a little, a little unfortunate. But it turns out if you grow them under the right conditions, you can overcome much of that growth deficit. One of those conditions, uh, excitingly for us, uh, is growing them in high CO2. So once again, if we add more CO2, up to 1,500 parts per 
per meal, uh, then, then we think the amount of carbon that's being used for oil and the amount of carbon that's being used for other things, the balance changes and allows the plant to grow. Uh, and in fact, as a result of that, we get not only more oil uh, being produced, but more oil per fresh weight, uh, which means that the, uh, the overall equation is even better. So we're pretty excited about this. We think we can irrigate these, these, uh, uh, these duckweeds uh, to make even more oil once we increase the level of CO2. And there are many other growth conditions and a lot of other genes that we're now trying uh, to, to increase oil production still further. So I just want to end uh, where, where Frank began. Uh, the famous, uh, the famous Azola event. You're probably all wondering how did the uh, how did the level of CO2 get so high 50 million years ago? You know, was it uh, was it dinosaurs with little coal-fired power plants or something? Uh, well, it wasn't. Uh, most most geologists agree that it was something to do with the meteor KT boundary that actually wiped out the dinosaurs and also uh, through a sort of extreme nuclear winter phenomenon wiped out plant life. Uh, for, for many, many hundreds of years, and that would have been enough to switch that carbon balance. Um, but uh, it resulted in an extremely warm planet, uh, one that it was warm for a very long time, and this, uh, this freshwater lake arose in the, in the Arctic by, by it being landlocked, and this is where we saw these extreme temperatures. Uh, this was actually the, the, discovered by uh, an international consortium who went out to the Arctic Ocean and drilled down into the, uh, into the core, uh, and, and pulled up uh, fossil plants, uh, mostly pollen, uh, that have been fossilized, and were able to determine that it was aquatic plants that were really uh, at, the, at the heart of this, at this phenomenon. And this is why they called it the Azola event. Azola is actually not duckweed, but it's, it's, it has exactly the same growth habit and grows with duckweeds. Uh, but Azola is a, is a fern, an aquatic fern, uh, and it uh, is thought to have been able to uh, draw about 80% of the CO2 out of the atmosphere in about a million years. That's doing pretty well, given that equation that we looked at at the beginning, 200 million years to make all the coal on Earth. Uh, you know, in 800,000 years, they were able to do a pretty good job. We have to do better than that. <laughs> we have to do much, much better than that. Uh, but uh, with, uh, uh, with, obviously, with uh, uh, synthetic uh, growth uh, conditions, especially you know, using uh, Frank's technology to really enrich CO2 to very, very high levels that, that, uh, that we, can, we, we, can, we can still use, uh, we may be able to get there. So I just want to, uh, again, uh, thank our, 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 our collaborators here. This was the group in my lab uh, who, uh, who did the work uh, on duckweed. We've got some, we've got some very uh, welcome new funding from the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy have given us about $10 million so far uh, to work on this over the years. Uh, so they at least are reasonably excited about it. Uh, let's hope that continues. Uh, and uh, and our, our close collaborators at Brookhaven National Lab, John Shanklin and York Schwender. Uh, Rutgers, uh, Eric Lamb is one of the pioneers in, in duckweed uh, work and, and also has the biggest collection of duckweeds uh, currently. Uh, and some uh, colleagues at the University of Missouri as well are helping us with some of our synthetic biology, uh, as well, of course, as Frank with Infinitry. So I think we'll now be uh, prepared to take some questions. Thanks.